All right. Welcome, everyone. It's noon, so we're going to get started. Welcome to our first virtual Kelsey Flash Talk of 2022. Um, today's presentation will last about 15 minutes, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A with you, our audience. Um, I would like to begin today's program by acknowledging that we are presenting from the traditional homelands of the Ashinawe, the three fires people who are Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi, along with their neighbors, the Seneca, Delaware, Shawnee, and Wyandotte nations. We further acknowledge that our university stands, like almost all property in the United States, on lands obtained through generally unconscionable ways from indigenous peoples. As we live and learn on these territories, we must keep in mind the community struggles for self-determination and colonial legacies of scholarly practices. Knowing where we live and work does not change the past, but through understanding of the ongoing consequences of this past can empower us in our research, teaching, and outreach to create a future that supports human flourishing and justice for all individuals. And uh, just has that acknowledgement. Um, so today's program, our speaker today is Amelia Eichengreen. Amelia is a graduate student here at the Interdepartmental Program in Classical Art and Archaeology. Her research interests focus on the processes of Roman urbanization about which she will be speaking today. And let me just admit these last group of people here. All right. So welcome, Amelia. Thank you so much, Kathy, for the introduction. And thank you to the Kelsey Museum for hosting me. Thank you so much, uh, Kathy, for organizing these fantastic talks. Um, it's been so fascinating to attend many of the previous ones. And also it's very exciting to be included in this series and get to share some of the research that I am so passionate about. So I'm gonna get started. <laughs> so can everybody see my screen oh my sharing has been paused hold on sorry a little bit of a glitch there I, I forgot to mention we we may have a, a little technical difficulty um but bear with us if anything happens yeah, so can uh, can I ask if people can see my screen now, if that's working? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's get started. So I today the title of my talk is going to be called From Huts to Palaces, Understanding the Architecture of Rome's First Homes, Houses. So the inspiration from this talk, you know, I signed up to give this talk um, last summer. And, but the inspiration from this talk really came from talking recently with many of the Kelsey staffers um, after my poster had come out. And there was a lot of excitement, uh, which was really flattering, really exciting to get about, do we actually know what Rome's houses look like? And Rome's first house is like, yes, we actually do. So right now, I'm today, the plan for my talk was going to break down um, what these first homes look like and basically go through uh, the architectural processes that we see happening um, in this dramatic urbanization. Whoops. Okay. There we go. Okay. So... The old cliche says Rome wasn't built in a day. However, you know, ironically, it actually, what we see happening is actually this dramatic urbanization process over really a 50 year period, but quite frankly, an even more dramatic um, short period of about 20 years, a just 20 year span at the end of the sixth century where we see literally a process of going from, you know, crappy mud huts to these monumental stone palaces. Now I say crappy mud huts kind of as a little bit of a joke here because the huts were literally composed of mud, straw and manure. So the people literally at this time would have been living in quite frankly, crappy huts. 
So is my little joke there. Um, and you see these huts. Um, so on the top row, you see these huts depicted on the left. Um, you see a, ver a physical reconstruction of one of these huts. And then on the right, we see one of these depicted a uh, drawing of this of this um, reconstructed palace palatial estate that we have which is called the auditorium site in Rome and just to highlight how dramatic this transition is I've you know included a somewhat modern comparison on the right right below which is this is essentially like if we were to see this the Shakespeare globe going from which is on the bottom left side to the Sydney Opera House, which something that is essentially somewhat architecturally basic, you could even say, going to something that is extremely architecturally complex. So this doesn't make any sense because we know that you don't just get the Shakespeare's globe and you end up with the Sydney Opera House. We know that there are multiple phases in between between to get to the Sydney Opera House. However, the archeological record is extremely fragmentary and partial, especially from this period where we see, um, where we don't have the entire story. So what I'm, part of my research is going to illuminate hopefully today is filling in at least one part of this story, which is the missing piece between this hut and, this, and these palaces. So, and that I am proposing is this intermediary phase called houses is where uh, you where you're using uncut stone before you eventually get to palaces. And what I'm going to do during this talk is I'm going to break down all of go through stone. and break down all these individual phases. So uh, I'll be taking questions off at the end, but if you could uh, hold off, sorry, on, until qu questions at the end, there will be uh, 15 minutes of questions. Thank you. So yeah, but so um, anyway, let's jump right into it. So first I wanna just ground us in where we are in the physical landscape. So uh, where, you know, we are essentially looking at uh, Rome and its environs. So Rome here is located on the Red Star and you can see Etruria to the environs to the north um, and then Latium to the south um, or modern day Tuscany and Lazio are the modern regions. And basically I'm looking, I'm confining my study to the, to the areas of the same, of the, of the, um, twofold bedrock because uh, architectural building is very, very much based off of uh, building materials. So I really want to limit my study to where those building materials are going to be similar. So that's why I've chosen to look at this region. So yeah, let's start with huts, which, you know, I have here emerging around at least around 900 BCE and go around to 500 BCE, but could be actually even later than that. And here we have, and I really wanna highlight this here because this is a Kelsey excavation where we have found some of these very, very important huts. Uh, and that is what we see here depicted on the right. We see the architectural representation of what we have found at Gabby, again, the Kelsey Museum excavation. And then on the left, we have a drawing uh, reconstruction by Eddie Stewart, which I think is honestly very, very well done um, on what we expect of this landscape to look like and how these huts would have been reconstructed. And we can see a few of these huts in the foreground of this image, where essentially what we have is we have mud, straw, and manure um, homes composed of, you know, wattle and daub is the archaeological term that we use for it. Um, and what we have is hut clusters. So basically, we believe that these are all one family unit of huts that we have um, around circling around. So basically, you have maybe one large hut where the 
you know, and that's maybe your main family unit. And then maybe you have, you know, a hut off to the side that's a storage or maybe a hut where the, where the kids sleep. But these are understood to be family units. And when we find huts, we do find these little clusters as has been represented here. And these husters, huts, of course, circle around, you go in between and out of them around this open uncovered space. And this is a critical uh, um, step because this open space continues in the later phases, which you can see right in the next phase um, of houses. And again, you know, it's at this Kelsey excavation at Gabby that you're really able to see uh, this amazing intermediate, intermediary phase of houses where we technically, so we have excavated the, the hut that I showed you before. Um, the Kelsey Museum has excavated that. However, um, it is our neighbors um, a little bit to the north who have excavated this house, which is named the Regia, quote unquote, of Gabby. Um, and this is a very much more, um, not extremely architecturally complex, but much more architecturally, architecturally complex uh, building that is composed of uncut stone. And we can tell that these are uncut because, I mean, basically they haven't been uh, distinctly quarried. Um, as you will see with some of the later architecture. These are essentially field stones that people have collected and gathered and used to uh, build their homes. So this is still a major, not quite as advanced as we're about to see with palaces, but this is still a major, major, major advancement because I mean, you're no longer living in a manure hut. So that's, that, that's, a, that's a pretty big step up in your life quality to now be living in this stone house, but there's still only so much that you can do with this house. You can only have really one story and um, still limited space. And um, yeah, but we do see the same social aspects that we saw before with huts, where if you look at the plan, the aerial shot that we have on the bottom is there's no uh, thresholds between passing in between the two, the, the three individual rooms, but you're still having to go outside in this outdoor space. So this becomes a crucial element of Roman architecture, even in later periods where you're still, you know, passing through this open atrium, these open porticos, and, and this passing through this open space, this clustering of rooms around this open space becomes a core aspect of architectural developments that I would argue even started as far back as with huts. So, but if we look at our next phase, it gets up, oh, sorry, not next phase yet, but we only have one example of this phase, which is at Gabby. So, you know, you can ask me like, why are we, you know, how can I just take one example and conflate it into this entire phase of these stone houses, uncut stone houses, um, so houses out of uncut stone, sorry. Um, and what a methodology that I am advocating um, during this period that I am starting to use during my research is using, um, is looking for architectural impressions in the background. Uh, so, sorry, we're getting a little feedback. Maybe if everyone can make sure they're on mute. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, so, and for example, Gabby may be the only remaining architectural, actual physical house that we have, but we can look largely to tombs for similar architecture. For example, we have the Tumba de Pian di Mola in Tuscania is a really good example of this same architecture as we have at the Regia, where again, you see multiple houses or sorry, rooms clustered around a central courtyard and you would be going in around between the individual rooms, passing in between through this open space. And we have long believed that, long understood that uh, tomb architecture often reflected the architecture of homes. We have a few chamber tombs that would have reflected huts, like Tomb of the Hut, for example. Um, so it really makes sense that now we have this other phase where we have architecture that, ex 
that expresses the architecture of huts. So that is a lot of basis of my argument for this intermediary house phase where we are seeing um, a lot of uh, impressions of this architectural phase in tomb architecture. So, and then now finally going on to the really exciting phase, which is these monumental palaces. And this you can see hopefully is very different materials and you can do a lot more with this. So these are made out of cut and quarried stone. So what they're doing is they're not just going out and collecting like, oh, here's a little stone and build it and you know, making a little wall out of it. What they're doing is they're actually going down to the bedrock, um, developing uh, techniques for quarrying and then, and then uh, using these massive monumental stones as their architecture. And when you have this monumental stone, you can do a lot more. So for example, we are now able to have multiple stories. So it's not just limited to one story, but now you can get two story homes. Um, and we have examples of this in the text where people are referring to, which we can kind of extrapolate from the text, even though they're later. We're, um, we have a famous scene where somebody is going to with the second story and talking from, you know, the second story. And so there really is this, but also you can look at the architecture and say, well, why would you big this, build this monumentally and not use the space? So we really do think that there probably was a second story here. Um, but your quality of life is going to massively improve if you're living in one of these palaces, because you're now protected from the elements. Um, in particular, we know that floods would have been tremendous during this period, and there would have been a lot of deaths probably in Rome from flooding. And a lot of these palaces that we see, um, actually, there are only two actual palaces that we have, which should highlight how few we actually have, uh, have, you know, this retaining wall, which if you can see my cursor is right along here in this reconstruction at the auditorium site, which is basically going to hold back any water that we have from flooding. So not only are your life standards going to be dramatically improved, you're not, you know, living in this crappy mud hut, but now your life could be potentially saved by living in one of these monumental palaces. So, and what I am showing here is basically the architecture of the two palaces where on the left, you see a reconstruction at the auditorium site. And then on the right are a few images from the actual excavation that we have on the Palatine Slope in Rome, which is right if, for those of you who aren't familiar with where this is in Rome, is right in the heart of Rome, right roughly in between the Forum and the Colosseum. So super, super, super important um, piece of, uh, land estate that I am working on as a reconstruction. So please stay tuned for um, the reconstruction that I will be producing on this really fascinating uh, palace in or palaces in uh, that are in early archaic Rome. So yeah. And finally, I really want to articulate the dramatic wealth, the gap. So something that I haven't been, you know, I've been putting up on the slides, but I haven't really been paying a ton of attention to uh, noting, and maybe if you've been paying a lot of attention, you notice these are all happening at the end of the sixth century. So all of these architectural types, we can see as an arch, we can reconstruct as an architectural process from huts to houses and then to palaces. But then additionally, we also know from Gabby, again, Kelsey excavation, that these houses were happening at the same time as these huts, and more so these huts were happening at the same time as these palaces. So this is just highlighting the social disparity between these three individual classes. You have a lower class living in huts, and then you have a middle class living in houses, and then you have a 1% at the top. This would be, you know, your Jeff Bezos of the time who is living in these monumental palaces. So, and this is giving us a new lens entirely to see the archaic period where before when we were looking at 
largely at burials, we are just seeing this upper class mostly who are being preserved in through these very, very wealthy burials. But I would argue, in my argument, the purpose of, well, not the purpose, but one of the main benefits of studying the actual homes and the architecture of these remains is that we are able to see, we are able to view these three distinct classes. So that is concludes the main part that I have had prepared for my talk today. And yeah, I look forward to hearing your questions about my research. Thank you, Amelia. Um, now we'll open the floor to our audience to ask any questions that you have. Please feel free to type it in the chat or to unmute yourself and just ask your questions. All right, we have one question from Ellen Lynch. What was the roof made out of on the uncut stone houses? That is a really good question. Okay, so um, we do believe that, yeah, so the, so I haven't talked, so I'll talk about roofs briefly. There was, and I apologize, there's a lot here and not a whole lot that I can um, left for me uh, working within the time constraints I'd had, but I can touch on um, the roofs now. So with huts, you would have had a thatched roof. With houses, you would have had, we know because we found terracottas at Gabby. And this is actually why it's called the Regia of Gabby is because it's, um, it is uh, very similar to the quote unquote regia in Rome. And the terracottas that we found at the regia of Gabby have the same architectural um, terracotta mold of those of the regia. So we know that the houses would have been composed of this terracotta or tile roof, which again, major upgrade improvement from um, in the huts because you know if you have thatch roof you're probably going to be repairing it a lot and you're also potentially susceptible to rains when the rain when it's raining you might you know few things might trickle through to your floor but with a terracotta tile roof you're much better protected from the elements so these houses would have had that's a really great question thank you for picking up on that and these houses as well as the palaces would have had terracotta roofs thank you Any other questions from our audience today? Oh, here we are. Um, they all have any one. thoughts connecting the nice tripartite building to similar ones in the earlier phase at um, Merlot? Connecting the nice tripartite building to the small ones. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, uh, that is. Okay. Um, that, that's, that's, yep. So <laughs> that is a whole, whole other can of worms. And I have so many thoughts. Um, thank you for that really, really good question. Okay. So yes. And I have, and part of my dissertation is going through and reclassifying many of these buildings, which were, um, believed to be, uh, may may have been other you know phases uh to you know uh or, or other types of architecture whether you know this main etruscan sanctuary or this um uh like at merlot or also monte tosto to i am reinterpreting as a palatial estate and again i would say we still see the same social developments where you see and this is something you know a slide that i actually had which i actually took out where you can see from the period of the house you can see um these corridor i have developed this classification um, of different types of winged houses. So with the Regia, but also at San Giovanale, you have this one wing. And then you, at Acqua Rosa, you get this two winged houses. If you know the architect, if you're familiar with the architecture that I'm referring to, which it seems like you are. And then 
uh, for this three winged house, you get something like Satricum, where you have all of the wings, three wings at the side that are all connected, but everything is still clustering around the central courtyard. And then Merlot, I'm arguing, and also Monte Tosto is this four winged um, house that is gained. So basically it's the same basic architecture that uh, is being repeated over the, over the time, just in multiple wings. And that's how we can draw the architectural similarities between the two. Um, and then what's happening in Rome is a whole other can of worms because if, you know, um, I apologize uh, for, you know, the people who are not familiar with this architecture as, as well, um, that I don't have slides examples to show, but um, for those of you who are familiar with Merlot or the, um, any of these sites I've been referring to, they are all very different from what we see at the auditorium site. So this makes the reconstruction for uh, whatever is going on on the Palatine slope all that import more important and what I'm working on, I think, uh, because it will you know, determine is the auditorium site architecturally just weird and different or are we seeing something architecturally um, dissimilar in Rome completely from the rest of its environs. And that's really interesting. So um, that was another whole other, so sorry for the quick answer. I'm happy to, you know, please email me afterwards. I'm happy to um, further answer your question. And I'm sorry I had kind of had to rush into it. That That's a whole other piece of my research that um, unfortunately I didn't have time to go into today, but thank you so much for that question. So we have three more questions in the chat. Any idea? of how many people to one house? Oh, that is a, no, sorry. <laughs> we do, we actually have, we actually have no idea. Um, because yeah, there's, there's, you know, there's no way to, there's really no way to determine that actually, unfortunately. So um, we can look at chamber tombs, but that's only gonna show your, reflect on your very, very elite, um, population. And also that's still not maybe a um, direct reflection on what is happening in, um, in uh, the actual domestic landscape. So we really unfortunately have no way to tell that. But thank you for your, that question. That is a good question that I would love to know the answer to. Great. And we have, you say there are two known archaic palaces in Rome. Where is the other one? Okay, so I say to, so that is a, you know, I would like to uh, make a little distinction there. So there are two archaic um, palaces or palatial sites. So there could actually be multiple uh, palaces so that we don't know. And that's the reconstruction that I'm working on now. So we have one, which is the auditorium site, which was, is right on um, the outskirts of Rome. And that was excavated by Carandini and his team. And then we have another one, another site. And by another one, I mean, not specifically another palace, but another site in, um, in the heart of Rome that I was just talking about before, where we're really not sure what's going on there, but we know that there is something, some kind of palatial activity, and we can interpret that there is something massive by the massive uh, uses of architectural stone and quarrying that is being used. So not sure what's going on there yet, but that is a large component of my dissertation research. So the other space, key space that we are looking at is Carandini's other excavation, which is on the North Palatine slope in Rome. Thank you. Thank you. And what is the situation with land ownership, i.e. how do people own the land where their homes are built? Oh, that's a huge question. Um, so for that, if you're interested, I would point you to, you know, other uh, Kelsey research, which is um, uh, Matt Naglak, and uh, who was a recent 
uh, PhD graduate of IPCA, and uh, Professor uh, Nicola Terranato, who is the Kelsey director, who have jointly published an article that are talking that is discussing uh, this land ownership and transition, where it really does seem like we have this um, this social land passing. Uh, they call it, you know, this house society is is what it is term, term in the anthropological terms of uh, basically this ancestral land that is being passed from generation on to the next. Excellent, thank you. And last question, what can you tell about how people lived from the architecture? E.g. only one room, so everyone slept in the same room in the huts, separate kitchen space in the houses, et cetera. Okay, this is another great question. And this was actually, you know, um, another could be a whole other talk. And basically, and this is where um, I am really um, diverting from a lot of the previous uh, um, archaeological research that has been done uh, in the past where scholars like, as I've been mentioning, Karen Dini have looked to identify specific usages of rooms. However, I argue that you can't actually determine um, how specific rooms were used. For example, a huge um, component of this is the stoves at this time we know were portable. Either they were made out of you know, some kind of metal or they were out of terracotta. But the fact is you, your stoves, for example, are portable. So they can be carried from one space to another. So the idea is you kind of have for example, for the kitchen is you may have a rotating cooking space. In good weather, maybe you have, you cook out in the open, but then in your bad weather, maybe you bring it inside to a room. So what we really have to think about is this flexibility of all these different spaces. Um, and although I should say there's probably some you know, uh, especially for the palaces, there probably is some, you know, distinctive uh, attribution to this kind of space. But honestly, um, unfortunately, we, I, we really can't tell further than uh, that. Um, because it's, we don't have the archaeological record to really determine that, unfortunately. So, yeah. Unfortunately, it's, can't interpret further how the domestic individual rooms of the domestic space is used. All right, we have one more question that's jumped into the chat. Do palaces spring up rapidly due to elite competition within Rome? If so, what were they doing with all this wealth before spending it on a big house? Or did they suddenly get wealthier at the same time as the palaces were being built? Yeah, that's yes. <laughs> is, and this is still so all of these houses, um, these homes are being are existing at the same time. However, I still want to be because this touches on a really, really key point. We still have this dramatic rise in Roman architecture where we're still going. It's still Rome is essentially being built overnight, so to speak, or within a day where it's we're going from huts to palaces and I can substitute this intermediary phase with this uncut stone which kind of sort of rationalizes kind of architecturally how it went, but still we're seeing this dramatic social leap and yes scholars are seeing. Um, have argued, particularly Mario Torelli, a major etruscologist, has, has argued in the past that this is springing up from elite competition. Now, another key factor that is going on at the time is also, um, is also we see uh, this happening right around when, at a really, really fascinating point at the end of the sixth century, when Rome is um, overthrowing their kings and, um, and instituting a republic. So there's a lot of social aspects that are going on here. Um, so basically uh, that are just heightened and really moving at a rapid rate. And what's super fascinating is, um, I've been discussing this a lot, honestly, with my uh, with a colleague at Notre Dame, um, Alessandra Piratini, uh, and we see the same thing happening in Greece. So this is a really interesting, fascinating Mediterranean phenomenon that we see happening of 
social and architectural heightened development. So thank you, really interesting question. Well, thank you so much, Amelia. Um, this has been great. Uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, we really appreciate your support. And I'd like to invite you all to join us again next month on March 4th for our next flash talk with Kelsey Re research scientist, Laura Mata. So thank you all so much. Thank you.